Morning, everybody. There are moments in every person's life when what we need to do is to sit back from all our busyness, all our doing, all our planning, all our worrying, and listen to God. And that's really the point of this morning's talk. We're going to read from 2 Samuel chapter 7, one of the most famous passages in the Old Testament. 2 Samuel 7, after the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from his enemies all around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. And Nathan replied to the king, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of the rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, Tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone. I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great like the names of the greatest men on earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. So the context simply given was that David is now king. He settled in his fine cedarwood palace in his royal city. The nation is united, the enemies subdued, the king at rest, and yet there was one thing that disturbed him. While he was enjoying his beautiful palace, God's throne was still housed in a tent, and it just didn't seem right to him. So he did what any leader does when dissatisfied with the status quo. They come up with a plan. So he had a plan. He was going to build a house for the Lord, a suitable place for the ark to be kept. So he spoke to Nathan the prophet about it, his spiritual advisor, a good man. He thought it was a great idea. Whatever's in your heart, go for it. The Lord is with you in this. And there was only one problem with the scheme. It wasn't God's plan for David to build him a house. It wasn't that the idea was sinful or morally wrong. 
as God went on to say, David's son would build a house for him. The timing was wrong. And David, for all his strengths, was not the man that God wanted to build his house for reasons he would later explain. So the Lord sent Nathan with a detailed message for David, and Nathan faithfully passed it on word for word. And we could perhaps sum it up this way. It's kind and thoughtful of you, David, to want to build a house for me, but you have it the wrong way around. I'm going to build a house for you. The house of David, not, of course, a physical building, but a dynasty, an everlasting kingdom. Now, that must have been an amazing message for this young king, this young leader to hear. And as we'll discover later, if you've been reading through the passage, David was so overwhelmed by what the Lord had said through Nathan that he just had to go into the tent of meeting and sit down before the Lord and try and take it all in and respond to the Lord about it. So that gives us the shape of this uh, short talk. What God said to David, how David responded to God. So let's go just a little bit deeper. God pointed out to David that for many years he had been content not to have a house. He had never suggested or wanted, he never suggested to any of Israel's leaders that they should build a house for him. Rather, he said to Moses back in Exodus 25, have them build a tent so that I can dwell among them. The tent had been God's idea, not Moses's, not any other leader's idea. He chose it because he wanted to stay on the move with his people. If they were going to go through a desert, then God would symbolically go through the desert with them. If they had to face searing heat by day and adverse winds, enemies in every hand, so would God. God wanted to walk with them every step of the way to get them to the land he had promised them. What an amazing picture it is. If you just allow it to fill your imagination, God dwelling in a tent. Why? So that he could be with his people, the God of the universe. What is man that you think of him? The quote David once wrote. Why would you even trouble yourself? And yet, you chose a tent so that you could travel in a desert alongside us. So God is pointing David to this essential aspect of the character of God, his humility, his compassion, his grace, his love of his people, his desire to be with them. In other words, David, the tent is not some poor second best. Don't be feeling sorry for me, David. This isn't some poor second best. I chose it, and I'm still content with it. Perhaps as a reminder to David that while he was in his palace, there was still a bit of a journey for him to go on, as he would discover. And the Lord was committed to follow him and walk with him in that journey. Yes, one day God would ask Solomon to build him a house in Jerusalem, a central focal point for the nation's relationship with him. But that wasn't going to be the end of the story. I suppose in David's mind, he thought he couldn't think of anything bigger than this. Build a house, 
God would dwell in the house as he dwelt in the tent. And that's it. That's all there is to this. This is the epitome of all that God is wanting to do. And of course, we know it's not. Because God was going to take this to an even higher level. And so John tells us in his gospel, and something we especially celebrate at Christmas, that the word became flesh and pitched its tent with us. Better than a tent in the Old Testament, better than a building. God in human form, in flesh and blood, coming to dwell with us, to walk with us. We could touch him, listen to him, speak with him, see him. We beheld his glory, says John, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What a story this is. David is being pointed to something much bigger, to push his mind, to change his perspective. And God then takes this to an even deeper level beyond anything that David could have dreamt of for himself. To give him a perspective on his own life. It's good to get that sometimes. It's good every so often to listen to what God has to say about me. And you're probably thinking, I'd love to hear what God has to say about me. If God would just write me a letter... Oh, I think maybe he's done that. What did he say to David? As for you, David, I chose you when you were just a young lad, a shepherd boy. It had been God's idea for David to become king. It wasn't that David got bored with being a shepherd lad and came up with the idea and said, oh, I fancy being king of this country one day. It was God's idea. God had been planning it a very long time before it even entered into the mind of David. God had taken David from being a young boy with sheep. And then, as he explained to David, he'd walked with him wherever he had gone. God had protected him from his enemies. God had guided his steps and now had exalted him to his present position as king. God had done it. Perhaps a gentle way of saying to David, it's not all on you, David, is it? You know, sometimes we get it into our head that it's all on us. It's all about us, all about what we do, especially if we get into positions of leadership. It's not all on you, David. This is the balance that I think many of us need to hear. It isn't, of course, that David just sat back and did nothing. But don't let's go the other way and think that everything is down to us because the burden will crush us. Whether it's bringing up our family, whether it's running a business, whether it's leading in the youth group or in the church, to fall into the trap of thinking it's all on me. It will crush you. You need to sit down and let God speak. I knew you before you were born. You weren't some afterthought. And God not only said that, he had plans for David's future. He was going to make David name great. He was going to make him one of the greatest leaders that ever ruled. He was going to provide a place for the nation where they could live in peace. But it went far beyond that. Let's listen again. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. And when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, he will raise up, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. God's plan was not for David to build a house for God. 
It was the other way around. God was going to build a house for David. Not simply that David would reign, but that his house, his dynasty would be established through his children. David would have a son. That son would build a house for God. And of course, we know from history that the house that Solomon built was far more magnificent than anything David could have managed at this stage. If your son sins, God added, I will discipline him. I will not withdraw my mercy from him. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. And you will rest with your ancestors, but your house and your kingdom will be established forever. So it was all overwhelming for David. God expanding his thinking, letting him in on the kind of God he is, what he's been doing all this time in human history, how David now fits in and what the future holds. So it's no wonder that David forgot about his own plan (laughs) and instead went into the tent where the Ark of the Covenant was and sat down before the Lord to process it all and respond. As I said at the start, there are times that we all need to do this. Whether we're leaders or followers or what we are, we need to listen to what God has to say about us, about our past, about our present, about our future. And we don't have to guess. He has written us a letter. He chose us, says Paul before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you were marked with a seal in him, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1. That's just the start of the letter. This is what God will say to us if we listen. You're not an accident. God knew you from before you were born. You are here because he wanted you to be. He has loved you from before the foundation of the world. It wasn't your idea, was it? That God should send his son to die for you. Did you dream that up? That was his plan to redeem you from the disaster of human rebellion against him. He sent his son. That wasn't your idea. He sent his son. He took the initiative to send his son to give his life for you so that you might be redeemed and set free from an empty, fruitless life through trusting in him, through becoming united to him so that you would share in his eternal life and participate in his purposes for history and beyond. Lift your eyes. Expand your perspective. Sit back. Think of these things. He's protected you from your enemies, seen and unseen. He has walked with you. It isn't just kings that God is interested in. God is a project that is much greater than anything you can imagine. And in Christ, we are all a key part of that. What's his project? To build a house. That's his project. A dwelling place of God by his spirit 
with his people, not, of course, a physical building like the tabernacle or temple or even God himself coming in person, but something at a level up, if you can imagine that, God dwelling in us. The tabernacle of God, says Revelation, is amongst people. A living, breathing, dwelling, spirit-filled habitation of God for eternity. That is what God is in the process of constructing with your life and with my life. Having a meaningful life doesn't depend on you coming up with a scheme to make a name for yourself. God already has a scheme that is way beyond anything you could imagine. You may not be top of your class in school. You may not be destined for academic or professional stardom. You may not have that killer voice that commands millions or a body that gets you noticed. You may feel stuck, unfulfilled in your work. You may have been deeply let down in relationship. You may have disability or illness that is life-altering. And what I'm saying here doesn't change any of that circumstances, but it changes your perspective on it. Because in it all, we each have a purpose that goes beyond not just our physical life on this earth, but the entirety of human history. Let's not be tempted to measure our life by likes and follows. In Christ, there are no ordinary people. Life itself may not have turned out as you dreamed or planned, but whatever role or circumstance you are in is being used by God to shape and prepare you for the administration of the world to come. That's the project. It can be hard to see. We lose sight of it so easily. Real life intervenes and fills our thinking with the preoccupations and plans and values of this world and what everybody else thinks is cool and important and valuable. And in that perspective, it's no wonder so many end up disappointed, disillusioned, wondering what life was really all about. When the fact is, our future is literally and metaphorically out of this world. As David listened to Nathan's words from God, he was overwhelmed. He went into the tent. He sat down before the Lord to try to take it in and to respond to God. This is what he said. Who am I, sovereign Lord? What is my family? That you have brought me this far. You ever said that to God? Who am I? I didn't deserve this. I didn't deserve the love of Almighty God for me. I didn't deserve the life of his lovely son. Didn't deserve that. Nothing in my 68 years plus of life has ever merited God's thought to me, God's love for me, God's grace to me. Nothing. Who am I? There's no sense of entitlement here, no sense that God owed him something or that the world owed him anything. He didn't earn it. He didn't deserve it. That's a healthy place to get to. It's not always easy, though, surrounded by such a sense of entitlement that fills our culture. Who am I that you have brought me this far? Oh, I think maybe at another time you might listen to a a leadership meeting and people talking and bragging about what they'd done and achieved, but there's none of that here. It's not I've brought myself. 
Look what I've done. I did it my way. None of that. The recognition that God was behind it all. God had brought him to this point. This far. Well, David's only in his 30s, like some of you. Not quite half time in your life if you live to your 70. But what a life it had been, especially since that day when old prophet Samuel had called at his home and to the surprise of his entire family, anointed David, the youngest, to be king to take over after Saul's death. And what a roller coaster ride, defeating Goliath, becoming a general in the army, leading the troops to victory after victory, becoming best friends with the king's son, promised in marriage to the king's daughter, and then being hated and hounded by the king himself, exiled before returning as king to unite the tribes, establish a kingdom that's the stuff Hollywood is made of. I wasn't called to a life like that. <laughs> I can admire it when I watch it in a movie, but I wasn't called to a life like that, and very few are. And this is God's sovereign choice. God has called us according to his purposes, not according to our own. He has gifted us as it seemed good to him. Grasping this will change our thinking and perhaps get us stopping looking at and comparing ourselves with others and rather get us just focus on God's purposes <laughs> rather than on our own. Very few are called to be kings. Few are called to be apostles or great preachers or missionaries. Most of us are called to normal life, connected in to God's eternal purposes. Let me ask you a question. Would you want to be king if God hadn't called you to be king? Or let me put the question another way. If you could come back into this world as anyone you wanted, who would it be? I remember hearing my old friend and mentor, David Gooding, he was asked that question. And he said, well, in the end, I can't imagine coming back as anything other than myself. Not because he was content in himself, happy with his flaws and mistakes, or because he enjoyed disappointments or the reversals of life or the pain, but because he had learned to be content in the purposes of God for his life. See, the ambition is not to be someone, to make a name for ourselves, but to know someone and be content in his design and purposes for us. And as if this were not enough, David says, in your sight, sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future, the future of the house of your servant, and this decree, sovereign Lord, is for a mere human. And you're talking about this stuff. David probably didn't grasp it then. But actually, God may have meant a lot more than David understood at the time. <laughs> yeah, he would have a son, and that son would build a house, and that son would have another son, and so it would go on until a son would be born. Unto us, a child is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And of his kingdom there will be no end. The great son of David would come. And he would build a house. Involving you and me. Amazing. Because back to 2 Samuel 7. Well actually it goes back before the beginning of time. Once we get our perspective sorted. There was nothing obviously David could think of. What, what do you add to this? In fact, it would be a very worrying thing if we could come up with something. It would be sad, wouldn't it, if you got to heaven and you looked around and said, well, it's not bad, but I could see a few improvements could be made here and there. The wallpaper's a bit off, and, you know, I don't like the furniture, and <laughs> be a bit serious. If you could come to God's salvation and think there was something wrong with it, or you could improve it in some way. 
but he could do something. He could respond in thanksgiving, praise, and prayer, which he did. And first, his mind went to God himself. Three things, and I'm done. His mind went to God himself. Overwhelmed, not only that God would do all this, but he would tell him about it. He worshiped him. How great you are, sovereign Lord. There is no one like you. There is no God but you as we have heard with our own ears. David wasn't repeating a creed or repeating a catechism. Not that those things are bad. This was spontaneous worship to the revelation of God to him on his own in a tent, realizing who God was and what he was doing with his life. Second, his mind went to what he understood of God's great project, God's people. Who is like your people? Well, I could think of a few answers to that myself. <laughs> David had found out quite a bit about God's people up to this point, about their betrayal, about their fickleness, about strong characters, about all sorts of things, even within his own family. And yet, He's not thinking about the character and behavior of God's people. He's thinking about the fact that they actually were God's. This is what it's about. It's easy to forget that sometimes, you know, in church leadership. I remember being a teacher, and we used to have these baker days. Are they still called baker days in school? Um, uh, they, these were days when you had a holiday. No, no, these were days when you were doing serious teacher training. And we used to talk to you and have coffee and wear normal clothes, and we would think, isn't it great? Isn't school wonderful when there are no kids? Aren't hospitals great when there are no patients? Isn't church wonderful when there are no people? <sighs> and this is what it's about. Flawed, broken People who damage one another, as we're going to see in the coming weeks. But oh, to get that perspective of David, if this is what God is interested in, there's nothing like it. Is that where you're at? Start of the book of Revelation, we have the church in various state of rags. Seven churches, some of them are okay, and some are a complete mess. End of Revelation. A beautiful bride. Can we see that? Listen, I can't even see that about myself, let alone about you. And I know me better than I know you. But God sees it. So let's take this by faith and realize that this is the project. As it's put in Hebrews, bringing many children to glory, sons and daughters, to glory. That's what this is about, to build this house, and we are all involved in it. And finally, David prayed that God would do what he said he would do. I just love this bit. Do you ever get to a point in prayer where you're not quite sure how you would pray about anything? I think after all of this, David would have felt, there's nothing I can add to this. God, would you please do what you said you're going to do. Fantastic. Keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house. Do as you have promised. This is praying according to the promises of God. It's not inventing promises. It's not deciding that God said this to you and inventing this and then trying to hold God to it and then being devastated and abandoning the faith because he doesn't do what you thought he had said. This is praying according to the actual promises of God. God committed himself to this, and he's going to do it. So let's pray for it. And let's pray that as we pray, God will do what he'll do, that we will discover for ourselves how we fit in. How do I fit in? What's my part in this with my family? What's my part in this with my friends, with my church family, with those around me who don't yet know Christ? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the overwhelming hope of the gospel. Fill our hearts and minds, we pray, with at least the outline of a vision of the future that you have planned for us in Christ 
so that it recalibrates how we see life, what we worry about, the stress and strains that so many of us find ourselves under. Help us to see through that open door as John saw that there's a throne and it's occupied. Oh Lord, fill our hearts and minds with your words, your plans, your ideas, your schemes, your purposes. And may we respond in worship, in prayer, and in commitment to your purposes in our life. In Jesus' name.